specialist in the room, I'm going to assume I'm going to assume that most that you on Zoom will want to read unless you're going to tell me that you don't. Um, would I like to unmute my microphone? No. No, because it's. Um, uh, <laughs> I know actually. it's all right. Later, I understand. Okay, so I'm hoping I'm hoping you'll. So today, we are fortunate to have C. W. Blackburn reading for us. Um, he's a mystic poet and released his first collection um, at the beginning of this year. Um, it's steeped in spirituality and the poetic tradition. He navigates the space between darkness and light, vulnerability and power with a unique and diverse voice and flow and an authentic sensitivity. He followed that collection with another collection about mental health in March, um, evoking the experience with OCD and anxiety, and 100 Colors of Being, Poems in the Spirit of Zen in September. So you can see, CW, we can see that you're not um, idle. Um, you're prolific, in fact, and he's now um, completed a publication this month, The Gospel of Silence, Poems for the Living One, um, based around spiritual rebirth and the second coming. Um, and I think, was it that one that's in tanker or was it the previous one? The Spirit of Zen um, is yeah. in tanker format. Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and his, his, he publishes under the label Sundara Press and his books are available on Amazon worldwide. So if you like what you hear and you'd like to purchase um, one or more of his books, please feel free. So without further ado, I'll ask you all to make sure that you are muted except for CW and I'll invite CW to read. Welcome. Hi, is, is the audio okay? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, <laughs> yeah? is the audio okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Yep, yeah, cool, sure. So, um, firstly, I'm going to read a poem from my little black book. Um, and these aren't poems that I've published. These are the ones that I was writing about 10 or so years ago um, when I first uh, decided that I was going to be a poet. Um, and there was a local open mic evening, um, which I used to go to. And yeah, I just thought it would be a nice way to start tonight to read one of these. So this poem is called The Tempers of the Heart. And that was a line from a Dylan Thomas poem um, that I used to read and I, I really used to love. And there's lots of interesting turns of phrase in, Dylan's, in Dylan Thomas's poetry. Um, but there was a line in particular, the tempers of the heart, which I used to think about and contemplate because a temper, it can be a rage or it can be an anger, but it can also be a moderation or a point of balance as in temperance. So that's kind of where I was coming from when I first wrote this poem, the tempers of the heart. First, there is a hunger, a passion and desire like curious children, we fan the fire. We long for happiness, delivered on a platter. Our feelings in the wind are sown, then scatter. Oh, for some enchanted evening when we reap our crop, and the confining aloneness will finally stop. Till then we live as if we've been torn apart. This is the state known as dreaming of the heart. Then comes love. We hold it tight in our hands, afraid it will slip away as motes of sand. We keep it trapped and small, like a bird in a cage. The door stays shut, so it won't fly away. There are skies upon skies, 
were never to find. Like a child looking in, but always on the outside. A miser clutching money for fear it may depart. This is the state known as possession of the heart. Lest the sun rises and shines with grace. In a mirror's blazing light, we see our true face. The walls are torn down, then strengthened and refashioned with awareness, individuality, warmth and compassion. When love beyond need takes on wings and is free, we arrive where we began, at boundless totality. An expression of spirit found in creativity and art. This is the state known as oneness of the heart. So that was back in 2011. Um, and then around 2012 time, I, I kind of burnt out. I decided I was going to stop writing. And I wasn't sure if I'd ever go back to spirituality or poetry or any of those things that were inspiring me at that time. Um, but I found it again around 2016. Um, my life got quite dark and I went back to writing my poems again. Um, and at first I wasn't really sure that any of them were any good, but then I kind of built a momentum behind myself. And by the time we got to 2020, I had about 200 poems or so behind me that I felt were good enough to be published. So I started looking around for publishers and of course poetry is difficult to get published. Um, so in the end, I decided to do it myself. And my first book I released through Amazon KDP earlier this year, um, which is called Where Words Are Yet To Be Spoken, which is where my lovely background tonight comes from. So, oh, hello. So <laughs> I'm not sure, it's, it seems to be flashing in and out from what I can see, um, but this is the cover to it, which is what's in the background right now. Um, and that's predominantly what I'm going to be reading poems from tonight. Um, before I do that, I just want to talk about the other books that I've done this year, which weren't planned. This was going to be the, the only one really, that I did this year. And then I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to spend another five years writing the next one. But in the course of this year and events, like I got a lot of inspiration. Um, so. As Ken was saying, um, I published I, well, four books this year. Um, so there was this one, there was Disorder, um, which I released in April, which was um, more surrounding mental health um, and my experiences with that, with anxiety, with OCD. Um, and then there was A Hundred Colours of Being, which I also have here. So that's the cover to that one. Um, so this is a hundred colours of being, it's a lot thinner um, and it's a hundred poems that were written in the Zen style, but also in the form of Japanese tanka. Um, so I'm not sure, sorry if that's coming across there, but yeah, um, so that was that one. And then I just did my, um, my fourth one last week, which is the Gospel of Silence, which is kind of the follow up to the first one. Um, so it's really nice actually to have done four collections in a year. Um, I wasn't really sure if that was a good thing to do, <laughs> but I think that they're all, they're all really distinctive books. They all have their individual personalities. So um, yeah, I hope that's all. Really good. If you want to find any of them, they're on Amazon. I'm also on Facebook as CW Blackburn. I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to actually read you some poems. So these are all from the first collection, which is Where Words Yet to Be Spoken. Um, and the first one is called Orpheus. 
maker of songs, leaping and sincere in the built voice. Listen to the gentle cadence of trees as they whisper their branches in your mind's eye, like doorways leading to forgotten rooms, beyond walls mere mortals did not care to define, into a kinder heart that aspires absolutely to abide by white. Cantor of integrity, dogged by single-minded devotion, reach down to rise up. Master your depths with the quiet that's found at the bottom of the sea. Diviner of invisible things, take back every meaning into your breath until your hair is restored to the source of all prophecy. Refuge and solace, where your gravity against the moon, stand in your glory ever smaller, ever vaster, until you feel all your thoughts could fill the space inside an atom. The step. Come with me now. We will step out into the morning. We will journey to that place where the sparrows are crowned white with days, where each heartbeat is abundant and filled with joy, where the houses are warm and welcoming to all. Take my hand. We will arrive together in that sacred country where beauty is the equal of terror where the near is at one with the far, where the beginning and the end are born in union like brothers, held close in a single breath. I will take you above, below, to the border's very edges, further than you thought you could go, beyond all the diagrams and discoveries of science, out to the distant reaches of the cosmos, we will witness the birthing of suns and exploding supernovas. We will glide like lovers over the fiery hearts of stars. And then we will go back together to that place where the hushed silence speaks, where time folds in on itself like crumpled paper, where all of space is absolute and divided no longer. We will arrive with happiness in that ageless city, beyond era and nationality, form and identity. We will see in the darkness, we have nothing to fear. So come with me now, take my hand. We will go together and I will step with you, lightly into being. So this next one is also, well, I said earlier, um, the first poem I read from about 10 years ago was inspired by Dylan Thomas, and that was inspired by a turn of phrase in his poems. This one is more inspired by the style that he wrote in, um, and it's quite personal to me. I wrote it after my grandfather died a few years ago. Um, and he was really my father figure. And after he died, there were lots of um, kind of things that came up. There were lots of contemplations, um, feelings of mortality and what it meant to actually be alive. Um, so this is called Elegy. There is a light beyond the world a sea of color the clouds all guard, where the shade of an image shaped by fear gives way to the terror of an ancient moon that buries the breath in a grief made of secrets. And the black bones of a man are burnt down at his end into the ashes of a child who listened with his beauty in the country days 
to the gentle whispering of angels and the reigning of heaven's glory in the night till his vision broke open like a burning flame to grow strong once more and sing the mercy of his name unburdened and blessed in the holy floods of forever and his soul in its praise rode outwards again like two friends in a forgotten summer laughing together as they sail in their shroud on a lake as deep now as eternity. No more shall his son know another spring, or his heart welcome the twilight music of birds in a familiar song like coming home, as his eyes, now blinded, forget the roots of trees and no longer perceive the simple mystery of a stone. His voice, once proud, shall tremble again beneath a flower bed of love, as all his troubles and cares become at one with the feeling of that higher air, where his words shall live on, dethroned and unmanned. And the memory of each daisy he beheld fades silently into the light of that final day when in the vivid stillness of his closing grace, he saw through the palest hour of his sky into the dark that existed before the stars began. This one's called Breathe, um, and it's something I need to do right now. <laughs> Um, but this one's called Breathe, and it's one that I wrote over the first lockdown period back in 2020. Um, and breath at that point is something, as someone who meditates a lot, that's something that's always very conscious with me, focusing on the breath. But it's also something that became strangely relevant at that time because of face masks and um everything that was going on then breath just seemed to be something um that seemed to become more relevant somehow um and i wanted to write a poem just to remind people why breath was a gift um as much as everyone was very scared about breathing and sucking in other people's jams i wanted to remind people why breath was a gift so I write this, breathe. Oh, and every line of the poem is my creative redefinition of a breath. Breathe. Friend of many lifetimes, invisible connection containing each moment. Breath, cornerstone of identity, foundation and essence of the warm blood's generosity source of vitality incarnating through the body, creator and preserver of thought, heart and memory, open door to the future, forgiver of the past, healer of pain, unseen whisperer beneath the flowers, unjudging space between sky and sea, grower of stars, ripening light in your silence, summoner of tides and the moon's full potential, drifter between worlds, conceiving and uttering every known truth, borderer of time, ally to above and below, undarkening ground that holds every simple lover of the air in the beauty of its charm, now and forever, with a power no word can define. Wounds. 
They are our legacy. These disappointments of the heart, the failings of our kin, patched like half-truths on the tongue. The shock of lightning that saddens each day, we breed fear in the blood. The weight of neglected lives, we have long since forgotten. That sudden tremble in the hands, like a shockwave running through the earth. Was the grief born in another body a thousand years ago? The anger of each jaded lover lives on in a newborn's eyes. Those first bitter cries, sharing the sorrow of every broken promise that left a scar in a world full of lies. This hurt, alive in every mind where the fellowship subsides. We pass it on in the cycles of history, like the wind blowing ripples on the sea. The sting of each heartbreak made new. As our bloodlines divide, and we build walls around our nature to conceal and hide this murderous truth we have buried from sight. In the keeping of our wounds, we have betrayed each other. So Chris, just a quick, Chris, just a quick time check. We've got about five minutes or so. Um, I was going to say there's just two more that I want to read tonight. Is that fantastic. okay? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really great. Thank you so much. No, yeah. I thought I was timing it right, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read you. Um, I'm going to read you one of my poems, which is actually about meditation. So sometimes I like to write poems um, about what's going on when I meditate. Um, this is one of the ones I'm most proudest of um, from that kind of particular theme. And it's the second to last poem in the book. Um, it was the last poem to be added to the book, in fact, um, but I'm really, glad that it came at the last minute because it was almost the perfect ending um, and it's called The Way of Love. I'm gathering my strength again, trying to remember how this story began, though it's easier to forget. It's true sometimes that I'm falling away, like a riptide cast out from the sea trying to grasp at some kind of understanding. That final solitary truth that resides wherever the fear bows its head and the pain is absent. Relaxing my defenses, I take a sip of wine to awaken my soul to the miracle of this moment and everything within it. The hazy sound of voices as they echo from the street. The crow on the rooftop opposite, which I have made my friend. The smell of incense in the air. Its smoke forming ghostly shapes in the silence. Sat here alone. On the threshold of eternity. I have become a witness for my heart. And in the space between each word, I have used to question myself. I think that finally, I have found my answer. I pause to take a breath and offer no resistance. As I step out of the darkness, at last to meet the light. So I thought I'd end on a nice one. Um, and this is uh, one that always gets a good response. 
It's called Two Hearts. My love, I think we cannot be defined by these names that were given to us. As if one word could ever capture the subtle and delicate interplay of forces that gives you your shape and makes you beautiful. We've been here a thousand times before, been called so many things, but in the next life, I think I would prefer it if we came back as two stars, blazing in a galaxy as yet uncharted, shining our light across the limitless universe and knowing in our silence, we are simply that. Thank you. Thank you. So CW, Chris, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for a great reading. Um, and we're gonna take in the room, we're gonna take a brief pause so that people can go into the cafe, replenish, take your empties back if you want more, um, drink or a snack, please do that. And we'll reconvene in about five minutes when Denny's gonna start with um, the announcements. I'm gonna talk to you guys on Zoom just to see that I've checked that I've got everybody who wants to read. So we'll reconvene in about five minutes. Janet, where are you physically? I'm in Westlake Village in California. Oh, okay. Where are you, Peg? I'm in uh, Nebraska. Oh, wow. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> I have a poem to read about the weather. <laughs> oh, that'll tell a lot. <laughs> I just moved here from Santa Barbara in August. Well, are you happy you moved? Um, I've been giving myself a year to decide. The culture is very different. Somebody That's good. There's five different cultures in the United States. Hmm. And this is very different from Southern California. So hmm. Maybe you can write about that too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, um, Janet, I assume you're reading. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, Peg, Elaine, Tina, Jean, Britta, I'm assuming you guys are reading. Just tell me if you're not. Um, and then there are some names I don't know. There's Aisha. Uh, I don't know if you're going to read. I don't know where you are. Huh? My daughter. Aisha? Yeah. Is she going to read? I doubt it. I don't she might. Aisha, I, I hear you're Nigel's daughter. It's fantastic. How, welcome. Um, Maeve? Paul, are you going to read? Yes. Okay, Paul, good, gotcha. Uh, Kanita? Sarah, are you reading? Maeve? Aisha, no. Okay. All right. Well, if I if I miss you out and you want to read, then shout at me later. I <laughs> 
Where are you, Sarah? I'm actually um, in Chichester, but I'm at home rather than going to the live event. It is pretty rotten out there tonight. Lots of rain. I'm very, very tired. So, yeah, <laughs> I chickened out. <laughs> but you've been there physically before? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because literally, it is literally just down the road uh, from us. I'm Nigel's partner. So Nigel's my representative there this evening. <laughs> I have to say, um, I was going to do a reading, but um, I haven't um, I haven't gone back over it. It was um, from a workshop that uh, Mike and Denny ran here in Chichester on um, the weekend. And it was fantastic. They did seven, about seven or eight exercises, um, writing exercises. And yeah, there was one last one which produced something, but I think I'll have to save it till next time. I need to, to look at it again. But uh, yeah, that was exciting. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Peg, do they have any workshops in the, have you found any in Lincoln? No? No, I haven't. I haven't. Have you thought of starting it? Well, I don't know. If <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> Forget that. You know, I did go to one, but it was for um, it was for fiction and not for poetry. Oh, okay. And it was kind of interesting to, to listen to them, but it didn't really affect me as a poet. So, yeah. You know, I attend a wonderful um, Zoom workshop on method writing, and it's offered. Uh, I like going to hear Charles Kruger teach it. There are only three or four in the class. And it uh, really starts you by writing the way you talk and then transforming it to go deeper. If any of you are interested in learning more about that, it's just wonderful. It's on Zoom. Yes. Uh, what is the, message what, me. Go okay. ahead. What's your email, Janet? Yes. Janet iPad, J A N E T. I P like Peter A D okay. at gmail.com. Okay. Maybe you could put it in the chat. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, I could. Uh, I'll work on that. Okay, we'll call you all to order. We're going to get. Uh... Oh, right, right. Sorry. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Okay, guys, um, so we're just going to start with, Denny's got a few announcements and then we'll get going with the open mic. Stand in front of it. Okay, good evening. Um, few announcements, uh, got lots going on as usual. First of all, uh, the Writers Club, which is taking place at the chapel every other Saturday is coming along really well. I think people are enjoying the different things that can go on, uh, the easygoing, Writers Club uh, the, for free, for free, um, free Writers Club. And the next one is the 19th of November, which is this Saturday at 11 o'clock at the chapel, uh, which is, if you need directions there, just see us after. The next open mic live in person is December 7th uh, and our usual time of 6.30. Um, well, Mike and I had a fab time on Saturday when we uh, facilitated a writer's workshop. Now we had fun and we heard some people say they had fun. So um, I think a good time was had by most of us at the writer's workshop, which will be one of many, uh, which we again, use the chapel, really nice space. And that was a three hour workshop. And did we have fun, Mike? Yeah. We had fun. Uh, and we're thinking of taking this into a series uh, to go onward into a series. Um, possibly there will be a post Christmas stroke pre New Year social event at the Crate and Apple on December 28th. And all are welcome. We'll give you more information on that. And uh, 
Watch this space. Watch this an space. Email. And it's really also a thanks to everyone for um, your incredible support this year. Um, lastly, but not leastly, donations this year have enabled us to claim 120 pounds in gift aid. So many thanks for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And the, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> Uh, the gift aid's free money, so that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to start. The rules, uh, I just mentioned the rules. I mention them every time. Uh, the rules are, I'll call you up in random order, whether you're online or in the room. Um, the order you sign up in is irrelevant. Uh, one poem, or one piece, I should say. Uh, no epics. I mean it. If you have to ask what's an epic... Leave it at home. Uh, okay, so we're going to start. I'm going to start. Uh, we're going to start on Zoom, and we're going to start with um, a lady who's uh, she's a fantastic writer, um, but she's uh, in the cold. She's in the cold in North America. She's in Nebraska, and she's going to be our feature in December, which we think is uh, quite appropriate. So there she is. Peg Quinn, fantastic. So Peg, take us away. Thank you, thank you. I'm very excited to be reading in December. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wrote this poem kind of about the weather a couple of days ago. It's titled Meditation and it has an epigraph by Eric Clapton who wrote Tears in Heaven. Like ash from a fire, white flakes of snow float past my window. It's early morning. The sky white. The only signs of life are brittle bird's nest exposed in bare branches of trees. The temperature 21 degrees. I wonder if the bearded man camping on the sidewalk last night survived. What about the doe stopping to stare at me as she crossed the gravel road yesterday as I walked? Tears falling from heaven like floating ash outside my window a silent meditation on survival. Thank you. Thank you, Peg. Um, I'll just add that this lady left Santa Barbara to go back to Nebraska. So you sort of got to, I hope you're getting help. <laughs> okay, next up, we're gonna come back into the room and we'll ask uh, Nigel, please. I'm also thanking Bacchus this evening, the <laughs> Greek god of wine. Same shit. <clears throat> Bacchus, now there was a god, a god of rare vintage, sorry, a god of rare vintage. Those Greeks, they were clever. A god for wine and a god for pleasure. Now that is what I call a deity. One I would worship, even get on my knees for a wee sip, and wallow in the rapturousness created by the manor the pure ambrosia. Thanks God, I think we could all truly bless. Thank you, Bacchus. <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> well, indeed. Uh, we'll go back on uh, onto Zoom and we'll invite, please, Janet. Welcome back. Uh, Janet, please unmute yourself. Let's go. Okay, so this is for all of you non-Americans about football. <laughs> and uh, in America, a lot of the men like to watch football nonstop, especially on Sundays. And I'm married to one who has his own way of watching football. It involves fast forwarding. And, but anyway, it's quite a, quite a sight. And here we are, this is what it's like to be a wife married to a football, football guy who's addicted to football but has never played it. Okay, here we go. I'm sitting within the four walls of my cell. Open door reminds me of a way out. But I cannot move from this Sunday chair as my eyes follow tight pants, testosterone, 
and toughness. Can you believe eight hours of straight football? I know you think I'm a nutcase, but he's my captain and I'm his quarterback. This is what I signed up for. Wouldn't you keep keeping on if you found a diamond? That's the time to make a sudden stop and an about face. That's the time to see unseen possibilities. That's the time to tear up plans and follow heart. That heart beats loudly. Why could I not find it before? It's become my beat, sink in perfection to my own heart. And now in the cold, dark morning, even the stars leave me alone. The lights across the lake twinkle, but they don't count. My hands are getting numb, my back is chilled, I can't move. And I have everything. The whole day is before me, life tingles. And another day is just beginning. I'm exactly where I wanted to be. I've always dreamt of being here. Yesterday, when I was in my football cell, I pictured this, my tomorrow morning. I was glued to the Mahomes-Allen drama last night. Those are two quarterbacks. Those guys, those two guys brought crazy glue and smeared it all night. It doesn't take much to get me glued. Men in tights tackled, bones broke, bombs bolted, ankles twisted. That was then, but here is now. Early morning cold is everywhere. The birds trill happiness and I'm glued. Where's my captain now? Dream sweetly, my friend. You're up there blanketed in the warmth of our fragrances. I'm chilled and quiet down here, giving thanks. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to stay on Zoom for one more reading. Um, we're going to invite uh, a re our reader for January. Third Wednesday in January is going to be Britta. So, Britta, would you please unmute and let's hear what you have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, I normally don't read my Scottish stuff, but because it's pretty much 22 years to the day that I came to Scotland for what I thought was a holiday, and I simply stayed, I give you a Scottish poem, and it's called Scotland, you're mine now. It's my little rant at my love-hate for Scotland. Scotland, you're mine now. I didn't want you. You weren't that keen on me either. First, you threw your weather at me. All of it, rain, sleet, hail, slush, snow. And that was just summer. I was thirsty when we met. You weren't shy, that's for sure. You soaked drenched and flooded my soul. Your rain came in layers and lots of them, attacked from all sides and angles, present, past and future. You're such a northless, southwesterly, eastern beast. You even spat at me from the ground up. How on earth? Then you put funny stuff on my tongue, like space dust but in reverse, made my words damp and dark and mouthful. I spoke English when I came to you, like the bard, like the queen. No wonder she's no on your notes. Your Ouija grew on me like a fungus. You're all right, hen, you kept asking. It was about a year in I stopped explaining that I was me as chicken. Like your rain, your words seeped into my veins. Fwished and drish fastened themselves onto my soft southern skin with stubborn, stiff Velcro hooks. I felt crabbit and miserable. Then, out of spite, I began to grab, swallow whole, and perfectly own your song. Sang it right back to you. Served you right. You became home. You, smug face, forever gallivanting. You were supposed to be a chapter, a short one, in my travel journal through life. Just a wee breather between two downpours and my grand tour of the universe. Let's be honest here, you're no big a No short breath tin, he ho ro even in your best kilt. 
I'm not going to put down my roots into your soggy soil, I screamed. But I did. Look at me. I've got clumps of you stuck in my jigsaw identity. You did me slot in nicely. You wanted pushed, shoved, squished. I rose to the challenge. Twenty years later, and you're securely wedged in. You, Scotland, you won't fall out of me in a hurry. If I ever leave, and don't get your hopes up, I'll take some of you with me. You're mine now. I didn't want you, but I'm keeping you, Thistle and all. Thank you. Thank you. Spoken like a native. Brilliant. Okay, we're going to come back into the room now. And uh, one of those um, people who was on the um, writer's workshop that Denny referred to. So I'm going to invite Bethan to come and read. Welcome. Um, can you hear me? I wrote this, uh, it's about an experience I had in the water meadows in Winchester called Meeting the Deer. I am enjoying the sky, a soft spread of yellow illuminates the sprightlier clouds, whilst the grey gift us with waiting hush. I am enjoying the sky so much, I don't plan to gaze down toward the meadow where the river bends, yet instinctively my body pauses. Lowering my vision, I'm filled with the sacred tingle of sighting a deer. She raises her chin toward the taller foliage, supping so delicately it seems she is not eating the leaves so much as communing and becoming their gentle growth, standing very still like the clouds. I wait with steady breath. She turns instinctively toward my presence and waits. We hesitate, the deer and I, amidst meadow and evening light, aimlessly, expecting nothing in particular. We listen. I choose not moving. I refrain from photography. I choose the stillest mind available to me in the present, approaching with a tread softer than I'd imagined possible. Every step she takes is harmonious, as though the earth and she share intimate knowledge of love and leaving, of fragile insects and a primordial faith in simplicity. I step forward, mirroring her pace. We meet unhurried either side of singing water, the deer watching me. I watch the deer. Here we remain. Fishes break the surface of the river, then splash back down. The deer watches me. I watch the deer. Night grows thick as day takes rest. The deer watching me. I watch the deer. Nothing needs to happen. The illusions that separate us dissipate. <clears throat> the illusions that separate us dissipate. We are no longer waiting. We are no longer watching. 
We are simple expressions of the meadow breathing through us. We are simple expressions of the meadow breathing through us. We are the peace we seek. Thank you, Bethan. Thank you. Thank you. It seems that um, I guess the last few times we've met, we always seem to find um, people, or people seem to find us who haven't been here before. And that's true again tonight. So I'm going to invite um, another new reader for us tonight, Jolene, please. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome, right. Empathy, the ability to understand the feelings of another, even though this is a capitalist society, I'll tell you that for nothing, sir. Let's go twos up on the suffering because a responsible government is still sadly buffering. Energy crisis, you say? Then how come the MPs are getting another rise in pay? They don't seem to be doing very well at their jobs. If they aren't careful, soon there'll be mobs. Should I eat food or oh, all my bones? Ask the lady born before mobile phones. She's a widower and can't afford to pay her energy bill. Her husband used to handle all of that. He died last month, good old Phil. I just don't know what to do anymore, she says. Poor and at the end of my life, and with such a compassionate government, the last 12 years have been nothing but bloody strife. I have osteoarthritis and it hurts to get cold. Life is a journey, but do you know what, young lady? It sucks to get old. Well, it does nowadays anyway. I can't get an appointment to see my doctor and I think I need an x-ray. I fell over recently and really hurt my hip. It's as red as the face of the chief conservative whip. And what a fantastic, <laughs> and what a fantastic job he has done in organizing the government that just wants to have fun. Prime ministers falling like dominoes, disregarding the working people's financial woes. The MPs certainly do like to keep us on our toes. Hey, how about increasing capital gains tax? Don't be daft, that would get right up Tory donor backs. The UK's best qualities are within our humanities, but they're being sabotaged by toxic Tories. They're behaving like parasitic fleas. Goodness forbid, we actually look after our species. Our little blue planet is in dire need of help. We need to do more than just plant sustainable kelp. Britain needs a green revolution. Our planet deserves kindness and absolution. To regrow the reunited family tree, we desperately need a sustainable green industry. Hmm. Wonder why that seems to be a recurrent theme. Like two weeks ago, we had a bunch of readings all about the same sort of thing. And I bet that's not the last. Um, okay. So moving, as they say, swiftly on, I'm going to invite uh, one more in the room, then we go back to Zoom. David, it's you. That's good. Perfectly. Good, good, good. Right then. Um, yeah, I went up to London recently. Um, actually, first time since the lockdown. Hasn't changed very much at all, I thought. Um, lot of, awful lots happened. Most of the Russian oligarchs have disappeared, but um, there's always others to take their place. Um, and yeah, this... Uh, I felt rather moved to write this. Um, I'm not against capitalism, um, and I, I'm not actually against the monarchy either, but um, I hate entitlement, I hate arrogance, I hate wasteful expenditure. 
Um, so here's my sermon for the week. Born to rule in the hotels of Park Lane. Hurrah, good times are here again. For the people frightfully posh. Of course, you know we've loads of dosh. Hard-faced men with haughty wives, living hard-faced, haughty lives. Champagne fizzing, corks a pop. May the good times never stop. In the hotels of Park Lane. Hurrah for Charles! Long may he reign. Thanks, David. Um, I'm saying nothing. I'm going straight to Jean. Can you unmute yourself, Jean, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to read some haikus. I'm working on a volume of poems, uh, and they're all in haikus. I wrote them in haikus because they came so fast to me like a bullet train and I needed to have a form to stop the train. <laughs> anyway, um, the first section, this is the first section of some haikus, okay? What poems would be revealed if the title were the graveyard of beliefs? Moonlight casts spells. The dream world come alive with visions, far flung, rising. What is heard might be sighs, cries, a mansion of layering memories. My neighbor Sam died of loneliness, is buried with his dear pet goat. Anna Guayaba has lived in a past life as a 12 year old nun. Coffins, etudes of wases and have beens, Mrs. Marx's suicide regrets. Houdini's rigged a hot air balloon to float him to eternity. The yogi's soft inner voice, even you must leave the Buddha behind. That's some of them. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Thank you so much. Um, okay, we're gonna stay on Zoom. I think we're gonna invite next uh, Tina. Tina, I hope you're still there. Hey, everyone. Um, this is a piece of flash fiction that I worked on for a writer's workshop. It's called Out of Darkness. Autumn has been particularly beautiful this year. Our country walks paved with a glow of fiery valedictory colour. We ramble hand in hand, red-cheeked red and content through woodland paths and pavements scattered with fallen leaves and tiny acorns. A sweet smell of the last of the squashed berries and the earthy fecund fragrance of dampness, fungi and wet leaves fills our nostrils. The silence is broken by the occasional gentle thud of a falling conker and a satisfying crunch underfoot. The cycle of seasons nears its end and we are aware that the stark months of winter are approaching. We feel a chill in the air and perceive a cloak of darkness, drawing in the night as evenings come to an early, abrupt close. Back home, the house is cold and dark, the sitting room lit only by a couple of candles, another power cut enforced by those who supposedly govern us. It will be a few hours until the lights and heating are back on and a feeling of warmth seeps into our bones. I pick up the hall torch and go into the kitchen to fetch one of the flasks of hot tea we sensibly prepared earlier. The winter will be long, but I have a few tricks up my sleeve to stave off the darkness. 
I open the curtains and peer outwards and upwards towards the full moon. I see a celestial magical orb of blood orange. My breath catches. You are beautiful. A big bold incandescent sphere shimmering against an ink black sky and wispy passing clouds. The blood moon, of course. I had forgotten to look out for you. A symbol of chaos, disruption and of change. Well, we know all about that. I go outside and reach towards you, drawing in your energy, your light, your magic. Breathe it all in for later. The next few months will be cold, harsh and difficult. The world feels like a dark place just now. They say the brilliance of the blood moon invites us to explore our darker shadow side and hints at the power of transformation. It tells us we may be both in and out of darkness, but we do not have to settle there. The end. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna come back in the room now and we're gonna go with Piers, please. Piers. Evening. Uh, is this close to the mic? Yeah. This yeah. Okay. Evening. I've um, written three poems, uh, all to do with the Pony Club. Now, some people might be allergic to that, so you know, I understand that. They're based on this novel, 1999, The Island, and uh, the principal character is a girl called Tori, who's the son of uh, uh, Rick. And she's learning to ride. Okay, so this is a bit fell well, all right? It's not uh, deep or serious. Learning to ride. Learning to ride. Toes up, hands down, kick on. Choleric, choleric colonel slaps boot with whip, bellows commands. Small, agitated girl flaps legs in an effort to make Pony move. Tweety Pie remains unimpressed and unmoving until Laura, stable girl, rattles a bucket of horse nuts from the corner of the field. Sudden, surprising turn of speed deposits Ryder on the grass. Here ends the lesson. <laughs> Thanks, Piers. Yeah. Some of us have been there. Uh, the grass, that is, uh, deposited. Uh, next up, please. Again, we'll stay in the room. Christine. Hello. One of the things I like to do is draw, and I like to uh, do life drawing. So this is from way back when we could do such things before 2020. Drawn from life. The studio is quiet, only the scratch of pencil and crayon on paper, or a sigh as students shift. Natasha assumes an elegant upright pose, one knee raised, the foot arched, hands in her lap. We scrutinize, Make our marks, assess, correct, and draw again. All flesh has weight and mass, color and texture. A line describing one curve must also define the hollow alongside. We struggle, sit back and survey our work. We use soft pencil or spiky pen. It's stifling. We shed our layers. At a bleep, Natasha stretches. 20 minutes have passed. This time she reclines. We circle, seeking the perfect viewpoint. There's a scrape of chairs, a scrabble for a dropped pencil. Then all is quiet concentration. That's it. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, and we'll go back to Zoom now for Paul. 
please. Please unmute yourself. Um, take it away. This is uh, one of two poems I wrote this summer uh, about spiders. I hope no one here is uh, arachnophobic. Um, just had a very long, hot, dry summer and, uh, well, lots of spiders, interesting animals. It is not chance that brought her here. She has chosen with care Assessing geometry and sunlight, checking off the list. A trapper, not a hunter, she has selected the best spot in which to catch her prey, and now quietly watches the hapless fly stray into the silver strand. Untroubled by anxiety or doubt, she knows she in the end will win gathering up, winding in. The minute she does not need to count, centuries pass by in her day. Her appetite measured, unhurried. That's it. Thank you, Paul. Um, I don't know if I'm arachnophobic, but um, I'm not very spot. I'm not fond of spiders. Um, Elaine, please online on Zoom. I've, I've been grateful for daddy long leg spiders, however, because they eat ants and the ants in California, just our constant infestation. <laughs> anyway, uh, can you hear me all all right? Yeah. Good, okay. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota around lots of lakes and rivers. So this is a poem about water and accidents. Death by water. They say two people drowned on the far side of the sandbar in the drop off, where a swimmer from the other shore was caught in a spring. One companion, then another, dove down to look, but only one returned. As a child on the sandbar, I always sought out this incline, peering into the abyss for skeletons, my feet feeling its warm, muddy depths slipping into nothingness. I remember another water death. The only son of my father's old friend decided to buy a kayak and test it on unfamiliar rapids sans a life jacket, while his fiance, who did not swim, stood watching. The kayak shot downstream through white water, tumbling and twisting and flipping light as a frisbee while alone on shore, his girlfriend saw him bob to the surface three times, an insubstantial cork. A dark, quiet boy at university, out of his depth. One autumn, my childhood doctor, much loved in the town, went up north to the Boundary Waters on his yearly expedition in duck season. An unexpected storm blew over the trees, roughing up the sky stirring up the wide, frigid waves, invading his little boat, so that, grave with drink, he fell overboard, struggling with his rubber boots, struggling against chill and inertia. He floated redundant, seen only by a man far away on shore, slipping into shadow. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Um, so we're coming back into the room now, and I'd like to uh, welcome for the first time, Jez. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello. Uh, this poem is about my usual subjects, which is landscape painting, 
Buddhism, cold swimming, and it's called Exhale. Like Blossom, we wilt so quickly. The most beautiful day is always the day after the storm, better than a new day in a new year. We bathe in a cornucopia of momentary calm, centered on a landscape undefined where all eyes become we for once. Pencils forgiven for breaking, sat at the feet of the crucifixion. How can we clear our minds? Where the light of the land meets, a lifetime of paintings live locked away, dragging like air brakes. It's interesting to break everything once. To do it again is pointless, like picking flowers. Rage has distorted our love, slash and burn memories of forest, exchange jungle for meat. It's an inert, sorry, it's innate that we are inert to the loving lick of the sun, a light that could feed if willing. To be is to learn not to think, yet I continue, like combing my hair with a different parting. It seems like the whole of humanity has run out of ideas. Get a grip, take control. Don't be defined by your suffering. Without the soul, we are just. I have no age. I have no gender. I'm just breath and stillness. My soul, like all souls, are eternal and spotless. Like crawling through concrete wasteland on your belly and crawling, we just forget. I burn my love on the altar of truth. I rest my coffee on Blake. My breath, a long line of humans, a million years strong. Consuming what the plants exhale, we exhale what the plants consume. Symbiotic, us, a conscious breath, a continual moment, going back to Tibetan plains. Opening the door to consciousness, taking control of fear. Learning from the landscape, embracing nature's cold. Be the comet backlit by the rising sun. Exhale. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jayas. Thank you. And uh, I hope you and Jolene will be frequent visitors. I hope we'll see you again. Um, okay, uh, next up, Mike. Thank you. Um, thank you, and a special thanks to um, C.W. Blackburn um, and his uh, featured reading. Um, uh, for those of you who are here on Zoom and also in the room, um, one thing we're particularly interested in doing at some point at, at Words Out Loud is some kind of um, panel or um, workshop or sharing um, about self-publishing or actually just about publishing in general. Um, there are lots of people here tonight who've got experiences of self-publishing or of um, publishing with uh, with a firm, a publishing firm. Um, uh, and I think it's really encouraging that um, uh, CW has, has gone through that process himself this year. Um, once you know how, it is surprisingly simple, um, and it's, um, I think it's very um, liberating to know that we can literally upload a file, um, albeit to Amazon, <laughs> um, but, you know, that's quite exciting, so thanks CW for that. Um, it was my birthday yesterday, um, and so... <laughs> So I um, I wrote a poem yesterday. I don't really know if it's any good, um, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, it's called Birthday Feet. Birthday feet are up for a few minutes. Population up to eight billion. Cup of tea, then coffee, then short pound trillionaire said, let them eat bread at twice the price. Nice life if you can get it. I don't think so. Just a glass of wine. At the bottom of the hope lies a bed of groundless truth, if you can be still enough. Here, there is just one pair of feet, the pitter patter of rain. Actually, make that a timpani of tor torrential leaving, of fall in autumn upon the raving heath of a mad king, or poor Tom of heart to see what eyes cannot. Stay here until seas of motion in your blood calm to deep. Look, the sun is coming out, and I know that something good is going to happen. Falling to hush, to hush, to hush, whir of washing machine, comfort in the meaning 
of folding card into a beautiful day. Thanks, Mike. Um, unless I'm wrong, I think we're we're sort of all done. Um, I've got one. And then if anybody else wants to read, then yell out and, and we'll close with you. Um, I don't know. I don't know what you guys were doing um, 10 years ago, but wherever you were 10 years ago, um, you were emitting reflected light that left you and shot out into the universe. And it is now 10 light years away um, and still going. So this is a poem, it's called 10 Light Years Away. And just for your information, there's a constellation or a system of stars called Epsilon Ariadne and Ariane, Epsilon Ariane. And that is about 10 light years away. Um, and Denny and I were back in Ventura in California in the summer. And I wrote this then. And it's called 10 light years away. Downtown. The cars stream past on oak, lights like bright water. Remind me where I am here again. Liquid is only liquid while the photons are close enough together, bouncing back and forth, illuminating everything in their path. Light is only light after all. But my past is now way beyond the Epsilon Eridani system and still going. Meanwhile, on Oak, the cars stream south as if nothing had happened. Lights like bright water. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, anybody else that I've forgotten, ignored, or otherwise insulted? No, great. Thank you. I didn't leave. You noticed how little time I left there for you to <laughs> jump in <laughs> deliberately. Look, guys, thank you so much. Again, once again, brilliant reading from all of you. Thank you so much to everybody who's joined us on Zoom, our friends from across the world. Wonderful to see you all again, and we'll see you next month. Um, can't wait. In two weeks' time, is, uh, three weeks' time, actually, because November, I think, is five-week month. In three weeks' time, as Denny mentioned, we are in person here, and this next, uh, those readings are always slightly different. We've got about 30-plus people in the room, um, as opposed to having 30-plus people divided between um, the various locations that the Zoomers are from and people in the room. So it's a slightly different vibe. Um, we'll look forward to meeting you all then. Um, see you guys back on Zoom in a month and uh, can't wait. Peg, we're excited to hear what you're doing and writing about the cold. So thank you. Ken. 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 Tina. Ken. Ken. Tina. I'm sorry. So December the 7th, is that a Wednesday? Yeah. Is it not? Have I got it is wrong? Yeah, I think it is, yeah. So is that the only one that's going to happen in, in December? No. no? 21st. Peg is the 21st. Oh, and the 21st. Peg <laughs> is reading on the 21st, which is the next Zoom. The 21st oh, okay. is Zoom. The 7th okay. is the in-person. All right, Tina, got that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, hopefully I'll be able to come on the 7th. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Look yeah, forward to seeing you. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, <laughs> brilliant. The 7th... The seventh is Britta, right? The no, wait. The 21st is Peg, and then Britta will be on the third Wednesday in January. Oh, January. All right, Elaine. Okay. Uh, the yeah. email will come. You'll see the email, Elaine. It'll be fine. Okie doke. Right. Thank you. All right, everybody. Love you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Bye. You, Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.
Uh, please take uh, please take dirty covering properly stuff back into the cafe. Immediately, thank you. Thank you.